Welcome to the actual news where we cover the stories that actually matter and nobody's safe. My name is David Hunday and in this week's headlines, an estimated 500 people have died and a further 1.4 million people across 27 states in Nigeria have been displaced by flooding after heavy rains and the opening of Cameroon's Lagoda. Muhammad Buhari has conferred the Order of the Federal Republic, OFR, on Atiyah Nasruddin, the son of Ahmed Idris Nasruddin, who was indicted in 2006 by the Nigerian government itself for financing cross-border Islamic terror networks. The Lagos Rail Mass Transit Blue Line has finally commenced track alignment as it prepares to open after missing its completion deadline by 11 years. More details after this. More than 500 people in Nigeria have lost their lives and a further 90,000 homes have been submerged across 27 of Nigeria's 36 states following catastrophic flooding, according to Nigeria's Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. Food and fuel supplies have been impeded and around 1.4 million people have become displaced, according to the authorities. Now, the authorities claim that this crisis was caused in part by heavier than usual tropical rains and also in part by the opening of the Lagdo Dam on the Lagdo Reservoir on the Benue River in northern Cameroon. Now, for those who may not know, the Lagdo Dam is an irrigation and hydropower dam built in northern Cameroon and opened in 1982 under the administration of President Ahmadu Ahijo. Now, when it was conceived, it was predicted that the dam would have an adverse effect downstream in Nigeria along the Benue estuary. Hence, Cameroon and Nigeria reached an agreement at the time, and under the terms of the agreement, Nigeria was supposed to build a shock absorber dam on its side of the border. Now, this dam was called the Dasin Hausa Dam, and it was supposed to be situated in modern-day Adamawa State. Now, if this dam was built, it was supposed to irrigate about 150,000 hectares of farmland across Adamawa, Benue, and Taraba states, which, as we know, are Nigeria's food baskets in the middle belt. And it was also supposed to supply a further 300 megawatts of power to the national grid. Now, shortly after the project took off, Nigerian President Chehu Shagari was toppled in a military coup, which was led by none other than a certain Major General Muhammad Buhari. Now, after Major General Buhari took office, one of the first things that he did was to stop the construction of the Dasin Hausa Dam, as well as that of several important development projects around Nigeria, such as, for example, the Lagos Urban Metropolitan Railway Project. Now, this was done supposedly because he sought to fight corruption. So, of course, you know exactly what happened next after this. Um, the dam never got built. So, basically, 40 years after, the estimated 45 million plus Nigerians who live Anywhere in the lower Niger or the Benue Estuary Basin, at the mercy of floodwaters that are released from the Lagdo Dam whenever they are released. Now, when the reservoir levels at the Lagdo Reservoir get too high and the dam risks bursting, losing its structural integrity, the Cameroonians obviously have no choice than to open the dam. And this is exactly what happened in September when the uh, Cameroonian state owned power company, Enio Cameroon, that operates the dam, opened the dam and as you can see on your screen this is what happened so this video from september 2022 shows the opening of lagdo dam after the reservoir hit 91 percent capacity now naturally as you'd expect the nigerian government's response has been the most predictable nigerian government response ever which is to blame cameroon because obviously it's never nigeria's fault it's always someone else's fault now, for the avoidance of doubt, this has to be stated here very clearly, that Cameroon is actually not to blame for opening the dam. The Lagdo Reservoir had hit 91% of its design capacity. Now, if the Cameroonians had not opened the dam and they had allowed the dam to burst, the result, which would have been a tidal wave of flood water, would have been a lot worse for them and especially for us. So instead of 500 people dead, we might be talking about thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Nigerians dead, if that were to have happened. So, unlike how the Nigerian government is trying to frame it, this was not an act of international aggression. This was an act of mercy. It is not the Cameroonian government that is at fault for Nigeria failing to construct the Dasin Hausa Dam for almost 40 years now. That's the Nigerian government's failure. In fact, as recently as 
2017, the, the current minister, the, the current minister, sorry, of, of water resources, engineer Suleiman Adamu, still made a promise that by 2019, the Dasin House Dam would have been completed. And here we are in 2022, 500 people dead, 1.4 million Nigerians displaced, no sign of the dam that was promised in 2019. So the scorecard is very clear. Woeful failure. So naturally, maybe he should be the next one to get national honor. For more on that later. Week, President Muhammadu Buhari conferred the Order of the Federal Republic, that is the OFR National Honor, on Atia Nasruddin, who is the son of Ahmed Idris Nasruddin, who was indicted in 2006 by the Nigerian government itself for funding a cross border Islamic terror network. Dr. Atia A. Nasruddin. Now, um, it will be recalled that the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, NFIU, the DSS, and the U.S. Treasury Department in 2006 all took separate actions designating Ahmed Idris Nasruddin, who was then the chairman of NASCO Nigeria, as a funder of cross-border Islamic terrorism. Uh, in particular, it was stated that he was, a, he was a primary funder of the Algerian Islamist group, GSPC. Now let's rejoin our Eritrean friend in the year 2006. The Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, NFIU, had recently been gazetted and one of the very first things its counterterrorism unit did at the time was to freeze all assets linked to NASCO Group Nigeria Limited. Apparently, Mr. Nasruddin had been doing some creative accounting to hide the fact that he was moving money around the world to fund Islamist terror organizations. Or at least that was what the Nigerian government itself wrote to the UN in the same letter. The real proof of Nasruddin's double life, however, came from the U.S. Treasury Department, which published a comprehensive account of how he laundered and moved money around the world for terror organizations. Uh, for those who may not have read the story, Conflict for Jihad, the Boko Haram origin story, you can follow the link in the video description to watch the documentary on West Africa Weekly YouTube channel. Now, Atia Nasruddin's conferment, as controversial as it is, was not the only one that raised eyebrows. Many also criticized the conferment of Education Minister Adamu Adamu and FCT Minister Mohamed Bello with national honors at a time when Nigerian universities were in the midst of an eight-month-old strike and Abuja is in the grip of an insecurity epidemic. So in my commentary today, I'm going to be examining whether it is even worth accepting such potentially tainted honors at all in the context of preserving one's own personal reputation and integrity. Now, you'll recall that um, the, the famous writer, Chino Achebe, was offered not once but twice the opportunity to get this national honor and he turned it down on both occasions. And he gave the same reason on both occasions. He stated that Nigeria had a corruption problem and he did not feel that it was morally right to accept the national honor of a uh, uh, commander of the Federal Republic, which was being offered to him. Similarly, in 2014, uh, the Nobel laureate Wale Inka was also uh, offered the Centenary Award. And in a lengthy essay, which he published on his Facebook page, he explained why he would never accept such an award. He stated that it, it was an insult to share an award with the likes of Sani Abacha. And he said that he turned down his share of the quote-unquote national insult. More recently, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie confirmed that she privately turned down the award which was offered to her in the most recent national awards ceremony. Now, what each of these three people had in common was that they believed that their values or the values that they publicly espoused did not match the optics of accepting an award from a Nigerian government that they either do not believe in or that has taken certain actions that contradict the values that they personally adhere to. 
Now, there has been a lot of back and forth, particularly on the social media space. Some have argued that, well, it's not an award that belongs to the president. It's an award from the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The recognition is from the country, not from the president. That the government is a different kettle of fish to the country. That if one gets this award, one is obligated to receive it because it's honor and recognition from one's country and not from one's president or one's government. And there's certainly an argument to be had for that. Some, however, have a completely different position on this. They claim that it is impossible to divorce the government from this award, seeing as it is the government that makes the decision on what recognition to offer and to whom. So accepting recognition from that government is, whether you like it or not, some sort of endorsement of the government. Now, where I personally stand on this debate isn't important, right? The purpose of this commentary is to raise the question in the minds of viewers, to ask the question that where exactly does one's personal conviction end and where does public interest, if there's such a thing in this context, begin? And if the actions of the writers that I mentioned earlier, Chimamanda uh, Ngozi Adichie, Walesho Inka, and Chino Achebe, if those actions were morally justified in their context, then in what context is it also morally justified to accept an award from a government that maybe you do not believe in or that you have expressed opinions that directly con contradict those put forward by this government in the past? So, for example, if you're someone who has uh, a picture of the bloody Nigerian flag from the Lekki massacre on your social media display picture, right? You have the NSARS hashtag on your Twitter bio or whatever. And then you showed up joyfully, you know, you showed, you saw that Ashwai B with Fila, you know, really sharp haircuts, smiling joyfully to shake President Buhari's hand as he gave you that recognition. So at what point does your personal conviction end? And at what point do you become a hypocrite? It's a question. And this is not me offering a position, or offering an opinion or recommending a position this is me putting forward a question. Because at some point, young Nigerians need to decide for themselves. At what point does your personal conviction end? And at what point can the system be said to be bigger than you? Each of us has to answer this question individually. We'll be back after this. This is an apple. Just dearly distinguished, I put it to you that this, in fact, is a picture of a common garden snake. Just for illustrative purposes, of course. No, it's a guava. I went to Goucher College. I have 30 years of experience. I'm a doctor and a journalist. I hosted the Grammy. Disparate opinion. The blue line of the Lagos Rail Mass Transit project has finally commenced its track alignment after missing its completion deadline by 11 years. Now, you will recall that in 2009, the LRMT project was announced under the Babatunde Fashola administration in Lagos State with great fanfare, and it wasn't hard to see why. At the time, Lagos was already one of the largest cities in the world without any sort of internal metro system. And this lack of a commuter rail system made life in Lagos borderline intolerable. It put a lot of strain on the road network, the roads were overcrowded, and it contributed to a real estate pricing bubble in the city. What that means, very simply, is that the reason you are paying 600,000 naira to rent a room at Palo in Fako Ijai, or you are paying 1 million naira to rent a mini flat at Fola Aguru, is because there was no solution for easy, large scale reliable, quick commuting from suburbs to the CBD, the CBD is uh, a central business district. Now, since all the jobs are at the Keja CBD and the Victoria Island CBD, that puts pressure on workers to try and live as close to those places as possible, which obviously then puts a lot of strain on the infrastructure around those places and creates the, an almighty real estate pricing bubble, makes real estate around those places expensive and just it just keeps going up and up and up it never comes down that is what you have been witnessing in lagos now the first phase of the lrmt project was the blue line which uh, runs from okoko to marina 
what this blue line was supposed to do on paper was that on paper it was supposed to make it possible to live as far away as Badagri and work on the island CBD. And you don't need to be a development economist to understand how that would have been a game changer and that would have been mutually beneficial for everyone concerned. Um, the completion date was fixed for 2011 from the start of construction in 2009. So we waited. So 2011 came and 2011 passed. 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, Fashola left, became a federal minister. 2016, Ambade was the new governor. He promised that by, you know, before 2019, the project would have been completed. 2017, 2018, 2019, Ambade left. The project still wasn't there. 2020, we had a new governor, the Babaji De Sonwolu. 2021, and then finally, here we are in October 2022, and this video has emerged. Yes. And for those who don't know, the LRMT Blue Line is a 27.5 kilometer line. It has 13 stations and it has an end to end runtime of about 35 minutes. Now, depending on who you ask, this project has cost anything from $1.1 billion to $3 billion. The red line, which runs from <laughs> Agbado to Marina, shares a track with the Lagos Ibadan Railway project. So, technically, it's already basically complete. But what that means is that the other five lines are still essentially diagrams on paper. Right? So, there's the brown line, which is supposed to run from mile 12 to Marina. There's the orange line, which runs from Moe to Marina. There's the purple line, which runs from Moe to Ojo. There's a green line, which runs from Marina to Ekpe. Then there's the yellow line which runs from Ota to Ido. Now, by way of comparison, the um, Addis Ababa light rail, which was the first uh, metro light rail project in sub-Saharan Africa, had a final construction cost of about $475 million and its construction took three years. Right. So it started construction in 2012 and its construction took three years, terminated in 2015. It currently has two lines, the, the green line and the blue line. Now, the green line is 17.4 kilometers and the blue line is 16.9 kilometers. Now, I mentioned that construction began in 2012, which was three years after construction of the blue line in Lagos began, mind you. And by November 2015, both the Addis Ababa green line and the, and the Addis Ababa blue line had been completed and delivered and opened to users. So basically, what that means is that it has taken Lagos roughly four times the amount of time, seven times the budget, to achieve half the results of Addis Ababa. So, yeah, congratulations, or whatever. And that was the actual news. Join us next week as we dig into more stories that matter and nobody will be safe. It's me, David Dane. Thank you for watching.